you, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to to be here today um, in Dublin. Our ambassador uh, to Dublin has been all over my office for quite some time to get me over to come, um, and we finally managed to fit the schedule. Um, and it somehow worked that uh, just before coming to Dublin, I was in Wilton Park for a, a discussion on Bosnia. And just before that, I was in Kosovo for a discussion on Kosovo. Um, and that somehow nicely transits into this trip to uh, Dublin, where we had a very uh, productive and, and useful meeting yesterday um, with the foreign minister here uh, to speak a little bit about what's going on in Europe. Um, and particularly what's going on uh, in Europe by the end of this year, uh, and most particularly in December. Um, and Bulgaria and Ireland seem to be countries that, um, when they look at issues related to whether it's enlargement or whether it's uh, uh, developments in Europe um, in general, um, each from their own perspective and from their own history, um, uh, somehow end up on, on a lot of the cases on the same page at the end. Um, we see things quite similarly um, on issues related to the developments in Europe. Um, and I think this creates a good uh, uh, commonality, where, which means that particularly now, um, we need to work much closer um, and in much greater coordination. Um, Bulgaria is the last, has, well, until very soon, it would have been only the last country to have joined the European Union. Um, and we're very happy to see Croatia <coughs> Uh, follow in footsteps and, um, and, and very soon become a part of the European Union. Um, but I think that the challenges that we face today in, in Europe are so substantial that we should not try to understate them. Yes, we should try and um, tackle them head on. Um, and they should, we should try and tackle them um, in a manner which strengthens Europe and doesn't weaken it. Um, um, I begin with this because uh, often there's been there's now debate about you know, Europe slipping into a multi-speed um, formula for its future, um, and you know whether it's a two-speed or a three-speed Europe or whatever you want to um, to call it. I think that there's a fundamental fear that we don't actually press the wrong gear and step into reverse, um, because that would be the biggest mistake we can make um, in, in the manner in which we um, tackle the crisis um, um, of the European Union now. Um, there's one piece of good news as far as we're concerned in this crisis, um, and that is that um, it's quite sure now that it wasn't caused by enlargement. Um, and all those cynics um, who kept saying that um, enlargement uh, was a danger for Europe and it would uh, uh, lead to its collapse seem to have gotten it all wrong. Um, uh, all, if uh, most, if not all, of uh, the new member states, uh, some with difficulty, uh, uh, some with great difficulty, uh, are muddling through the situation as we speak, um, but generally are not causing uh, trouble for the rest of the European Union. Um, what this crisis seems to have been caused of by is the fact that rules had been broken. Um, and consistently over a, a long period of time. Um, and how we respond to that um, is, is really um, a great big challenge uh, for us all. I say this coming from a country that has gone through its own financial um, and economic crisis in 1995, 96, and 97, um, having come out of it uh, after a period of hyperinflation and a com almost a complete collapse of its banking sector um, uh, with a national consensus um, on two things. One, uh, that there is the, the foremost and the most important thing for all politi pol politicians in government and out of government is to keep the finances of the country stable. Um, and secondly, to ensure that salaries do not grow um, or outpace growth of productivity. Um, in that second bit, we seem to have been inspired by Irish experiences um, over the last uh, uh, few decades. Um, having reached that consensus in, in 96, in particular, we've enshrined it in law. Um, and this is why, uh, years later, um, even today, uh, with great limitations and with great sacrifice um, on, on, on behalf of all of us, 
Um, Bulgaria manages to retain a budget deficit of uh, um, just under 3% this year um, and planning 1.5% for next year. Uh, I say this with great difficulty because uh, it does affect um, a lot of programs um, in the country and it means a massive overhaul of the public administration um, and the way things are done um, overall. But the belief that the that keeping the finances of a country um, uh, are at the core of its um, stability is very much something that we have all taken to heart way before the crisis in Europe had started. Of course, what makes it easier for us is the fact that we uh, seem to have the lower taxes, the lowest taxes in Europe, a flat corpor corporate 10% uh, tax and a flat income tax of 10%. So you're all very much welcome um, uh, to come and relocate to Bulgaria. And I think our weather is a little bit better than here. Um, uh, but uh, this, is, this has been an important task. Um, and this is, to, to get to this point has been an important task and it's an important achievement to keep it, to keep those levels. Uh, particularly because we are the poorest country in the European Union and we need to be able to catch up to the standards of living and to growth um, and productivity uh, levels um, in the rest of the European Union, um, in you know, Central Europe and, 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 and the old member states. Uh, so this low tax base is a way, in a way one of our instruments to try and stimulate growth and investment to try and, 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 and catch up quicker. Um, I say this uh, very much at the beginning because I, um, I, I hope it signifies that we're not great big fans of tax harmonization in Europe, um, unless, of course, it harmonizes at the levels of our taxes. Uh, we'd be very happy to see that, but there's um, hardly any chance of that happening. Um, but uh, we believe that it is important as we address the crisis in Europe to understand that there still remain differences within the European continent um, in terms of opportunities, in terms of uh, um, standards of living in terms of sources of economic growth. And we need to strengthen those parts of Europe um, uh, that for historical and for other reasons um, are on the catching up side um, and allow them to also uh, be able to move forward um, in a manner that supports our growth targets in Europe but it doesn't let, uh, let go of, of whole regions or of whole countries in Europe. Um, so this is sort of a second covenant in, within our own domestic um, agreement on how we tackle um, uh, uh, the crisis uh, currently that, that we face um, uh, on the continent. Of course, um, uh, how that translates into debates in Brussels is very, very important for us. And here, um, I believe that Bulgaria is one of those countries that definitely does not want to see a multi-speed Europe in which countries um, end up uh, divided in a permanent structures uh, based on uh, uh, agreements reached on economic policy coordination or other, um, uh, or other areas. However, uh, we're not a country that wants to uh, stay aside from uh, the further integration of Europe. We're quite happy with seeing Europe uh, come together and integrate um, further. Um, and in this, um, our positions have been very, uh, very consistent and very uh, carefully balanced because our own economy being small and completely open uh, to the rest of the U Union um, is very much influenced by uh, developments in countries like Germany and, and the direction that their economies take. Um, but also our economy uh, is very much affected by the perception of the region in which we live. Um, and I say this uh, as a particular concern uh, because the uh, fact that we now have um, the situation in, in Greece that we've had for some time um, causes great concern for us. Uh, Greece is our neighbor. Uh, it is uh, traditionally, um, I think, the first or the second biggest investor in the country, or at least one of the top three. Um, um, we have uh, about 20 or th up to 30 percent of our banking sector is um, owned by Greek banks. Um, we have been isolated from the Greek crisis until this point. Um, indeed, some will argue that we've seen a, a strangely twisted positive effect with Greek companies le relocating north of the border um, as, as the situation in Greece continues. Um, uh, well, that's a little bit... Um, 
Um, you know, some people actually in, in, in Bulgarian media will be quite happy about that. I'm not sure, really sure that we should be very happy about that because we want to see our neighbors come out of the crisis as quickly as possible um, and in a manner that is sustainable. Uh, but very much along the lines of policies that we have undertaken over the years, including um, strict fiscal discipline, containing budget deficit, and limiting, limiting um, um, uh, public debt um, indeed. Now, to I, I said about perception, because even though Bulgaria is not affected on a daily basis by the crisis um, in Greece, um, the perception that the whole region is affected by the Greek crisis um, is there. Um, and this obviously limits the uh, uh, foreign direct investment in the country, um, and it creates obstacles that um, weren't there before. Um, and uh, this is one challenge which we're trying to uh, address as a government, to reach out beyond this, uh, this, this perception um, and, and look for new markets and new investments um, um, in our own economy, uh, particularly within the Gulf, the Middle East, the broader Middle East, um, and, and the rising powers of uh, China, Brazil, and, um, and others, and obviously having a Brazilian president whose father was born in Bulgaria and has a Bulgarian name helps uh, in, in, to some extent, at least in that part of the world. Um, so this is, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is indeed a challenge. The second challenge, um, and I come back to Europe, is that um, in our part of the world, foreign policy still matters. Um, um, Often these days, and um, I personally find it extremely annoying, is that every time we try and have a foreign policy discussion with somebody, it ends up about a discussion about the crisis in Europe, and we don't really talk about foreign policy. But in the Balkans, foreign policy really matters. Um, and particularly now, as we head towards the December European Council, where you know, hopefully decisions will be taken on uh, Serbia, on Montenegro, um, and, and, and you know, the, the rest of the enlargement, or the European perspective for the, uh, uh, for the Balkans beyond uh, Croatia's accession. Um, it matters because uh, the, uh, we believe very strongly that you know, you know, no country can be an isolated island from its own environment. Um, and if there is uncertainty in our neighbors, if there's uncertainty in the perspective or the future of our neighbors um, or the policies that they have, uh, be that in Greece, be that in the Balkans, be that anywhere else, um, it creates constraints for our own economy and for our own growth. Um, and this is why um, I hope sincerely that we will, as we head towards the December European Council, um, um, our heads of state and government will be able to take decisions that go beyond Croatia's accession to the European Union. Uh, in, if it would be unfortunate if Croatia were welcomed in the European Union and no progress uh, be uh, seen with other countries in the region. That would uh, not send the right signal uh, to reform-minded governments or public opinions in the region um, and of the Western Balkans. And, and sending that signal is, 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 is quite crucial. So uh, for us, from our own little uh, perspective, um, it is very important to uh, extend a, a hand to Montenegro, um, and particularly in, in, in December, um, and, and to look forward to extending a hand to, to Serbia and not to forget Kosovo uh, and not to forget the fact that there is one uh, country in Southeastern Europe, still the only one, there's only one country with which uh, the European Union has no contractual relationship, that's Kosovo, um, and whose citizens uh, are the only citizens of a country in Southeastern Europe that have no um, perspective, no debate, no, 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 no discussion with Europe on the possibility of a, a, a freer uh, visa uh, regime with the rest of Europe. So I think it's quite important for uh, the stability of all of, of our part of the world to focus on that. Um, now that may not be really a very um, uh, traditional way of approaching um, uh, the challenge of how do we deal with the crisis in Europe um, uh, when you look at it from um, perhaps in the north of Europe, um, but from, from our neck of the woods, this is very, very important. Um, because as I said, the perception of the region, the challenges that the region faces um, um, are, are definitely there. Um, and that there are two other areas, perhaps, which are, uh, which are key. One is uh, uh, how do we address the challenge of the strategic partnerships that Europe has? And this is something, Ireland in particular here, um, uh, has a particularly important uh, role to play. Um, th there's much debate in Brussels uh, who are our strategic partners in, 
and in, 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 in around the world, China, and America, and Russia, and Brazil, and South Africa, and so on and so on. Um, and you can probably list a very long list of strategic partners um, if you sort of try and take a, a vanity case approach, of, you know, have a little box of strategic partners and then we, 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 we show them around and, and, and we feel very proud of, uh, of the strategic partners that we have. But it's very important to understand that uh, it is essential for, the, for finding a solution to the economic crisis in Europe and for strengthening Europe's role in the world um, that we begin distinguishing between strategic partners um, and strategic, strategic partnering on, with, on specific issues with countries. Um, and uh, Bulgaria believes very strongly that if we have one strategic partner in Europe, that is the United States of America. Um, with all the differences that we may have, with all the, uh, uh, the debates that we may have as to uh, foreign policy issues or economic policy issues, um, it is very important for us to retain that and strengthen that, um, that partnership. Uh, uh, recently, there was a transatlantic um, a trends survey which came out, I think, a few, a few months ago, in September, um, which showed a, a dramatic change uh, in, in, in public opinion. The 50 percent of European public opinion still thinks that America is the, uh, the, uh, the key partner for Europe. Uh, for the first time, more than, or, or just over 50 percent of U.S. public opinion thought that Asia um, was America's strategic uh, uh, but not Europe, um, and I think this changes. This change. This, this certainly reflects uh, uh, developments at a global level, um, but it is in our European interest uh, to strengthen that partnership uh, much more and, and invest much more, uh, perhaps than uh, uh, than we've done in the past. Um, um, and this has quite a significant implication for how we handle the global the global crisis. Um, financial crisis, and this has quite substantial implication on how we uh, uh, respond to specific issues that are being debated in Europe um, uh, right now. Whether it is, um, um, you know, the, 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 the ta ta taxing bank uh, transactions, or whether it is um, how we uh, overall, uh, what, what approach we take overall in terms of responding to the uh, to the economic uh, challenges. Um, so, uh, uh, last point, uh, uh, if I may, from our own, again, uh, uh, Bulgarian perspective, uh, great challenge for Europe um, and indeed a test, a real test for all of us uh, beyond uh, the, the, the financial crisis right now is our response to the Arab Spring and to developments in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, again, something that we watch very closely back home because of its proximity. Um, indeed, if you take a flight from Sofia to, to Brussels, it would be, what, about three hours, two and a half hours. If you take a, a flight from Sofia to Damascus, it would be less than two hours. Um, and if you take a flight to, to Tel Aviv, it would be less than two hours. So anything that happens in that part of the world immediately affects us, and we have uh, strong traditional links um, as well. Um, and we believe that very uh, strongly that if um, it, is, it is really wrong to sort of... Uh, uh, to sit on a sit on the fence in a, in a sort of almost panicky mood and say, well, you know, who things are not going in the right direction. We have all these, you know, sort of quote unquote, wrong people that will be taking power across the region. It's, it's very wrong to approach that situation in that way. What we should be doing is going way out of our way in assisting uh, secular movements and, and setting up institutions um, in the countries of North Africa and the Middle East. Um, that are interested in, um, um, in, in managing a transition to uh, uh, a democratic state. Um, and there's, there's much for Europe to do there, um, uh, both in terms of um, uh, opening up markets, very difficult, uh, uh, particularly with some member states, the debate on that is very difficult, uh, allowing for more mobility, um, again, not difficult, but politically sensitive, um, um, particularly for students, uh, very important indeed, um, but also uh, key is to uh, uh, you know, finally be able to push forward with one uh, uh, project that the, 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 the Polish presidency has been very um, keen on, um, and that is the establishment of the European Endowment for Democracy, um, an instrument that would really help us uh, reach out as a community based on values and help those that, that share our values um, and strengthen their 
uh, strengthen their chances of success in, in, in these countries. Um, what we're doing back home domestically on this as well, we, we, we sat, as, as Egypt was changing the first time, um, um, we um, sat back and we sort of looked and identified certain parallels between things what happened, things that happened in our own country in the early eight, days of 89 and 90 um, and developments in Egypt. Um, was it really a revolution? Um, you know, questions, similar questions were asked back home. Um, indeed, there was back home. There was a second episode, if I may call it, as we saw yesterday and the day before that in Egypt, that uh, presses for further change. Um, it's a sort of nightly raids in which archives seem to uh, burn and disappear quickly, uh, both in Egypt and, and Bulgaria. Uh, <laughs> quite a standard history in our case in 89 and 90. You, know, you wake up one morning and, oh my God, there's been a fire in the police station and no, no, no files have um, been able to survive from the old regime. So we figured out that there are these different similarities and, of course, many, many differences. Um, and in May of this year, we called a conference um, in which we invited activists and government uh, officials and NGOs and from Morocco to Yemen to meet with um, activists that were crucial in the uh, uh, changes in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, not to tell them how they should be uh, doing their job, our friends in the Arab world, but to share our experience, tell them what we did wrong, what we did right, where we think we succeeded and where we uh, apparently failed. Um, and uh, it's been quite useful, it's been extremely successful, uh, and it's spurred off a process of its own. Um, and the early days of December, we have sort of a second event, um, which was planned as a small workshop. Of now it's gone into over 150 people coming, I think. Um, which is no longer a small workshop. I don't know how we'll manage it. But um, it's on transitional justice in, in the Middle East and dealing with the, with the legacy of the regime in the past. Um, uh, early next year, we'll also be doing, the first half of next year, we'll be doing something on security sector reform. So our own domestic attempt in helping that um, is to create an environment in which we can at least have a tool through which we share our experience with our friends in the Arab world, hopefully help them avoid uh, uh, the mistakes that we, we did um, with the belief that, that if we are able to extend our community of values, if we're able to share our uh, uh, freedom uh, with the regions beyond us, that will help our own country um, and the environment in which um, our economy can, um, can succeed um, and, and can move forward. Um, obviously, there are specific concerns um, related to countries like Syria, for example, which we have a, uh, which is which is quite close to us, and we watch very carefully. Um, but this is this is sort of the, the more the, 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 the overall approach which we take to um, uh, to debates um, um, in Europe. And in this, I think again with Ireland, um, we've seen quite a lot of similarity of our views. Um, obviously, starting from a different historic uh, perspective and experience, but ending up in the same. Um, position wanting a stronger Europe, um, uh, one that is that underlines the fundamental principles of solidarity and, and, and community um, that Europe is based, um, and, um, and and rules, and that seems to be um, you know, that seems to be the, the the word of the day, and getting everyone to really abide by the rules that um, that have been set in place for all of us. But I, I don't know if I've taken up too much time. I think. But thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed.